Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt. We now turn to the little poem number 15 in the inscriptions, uh, poems of the 24 inscription poems. This one is called Me Imperturbe. As we've pointed out, Whitman sometimes liked to use these a little bit different kind of words. I mean, you can obviously see imperturbed in imperturbe. Um, it is a, a word which will mean unruffled or standing at ease, he will call it confidence, a certain kind of assurance or self-confidence. Now, um, uh, we're going we're gonna to enjoy seeing this poem as a somewhat personal statement of Whitman's, but also as a suggestion of a way to live one's life in the middle of the pain and suffering of the world, what we'll call here in a bit theodicy, right? Um, now let's get to, through our assumptions quickly. Our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. Down that left-hand side, we call these lectures Talks with Walt as we work through, in chronological order, the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. Why? Because we want to remind ourselves that we really are the stories that we tell, that we retell. We are the stories that we decide to accept. We are the stories that we decide as well to reject. We also assume a working familiarity with our learning theory. That is to say, we're always trying to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. The new is the new. The N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Our annotative approach at level one, what does the text say at level two, what does the text mean at level three, how can I relate to that information in some meaningful way. We also assume a knowledge of our big five, epistemology, what you can know, we're going to have some of that here. The attempt to appreciate the fallibilist position as opposed to an absolutist or a relativist position epistemologically in terms of knowledge. Ontologically, who am I? And here we're going to play around with comparisons between the human and trees and animals, which will be fascinating for us. Or if we're working continued with our big five, what do we know about psychology, the study of the individual mind, sociology, the study of the collective mind? But most significantly for our big five in this poem will be the theodicy question. That is to say, why is it that bad things have to happen, especially when we don't want them to happen, when people treat us poorly and the like? How do we respond to that? And it will be here that we will pick up so strongly with Whitman's theodicy. And make no, make no mistake. He's aware of Milton's theodicy and Homer's theodicy and Virgil's theodicy and Dante's theodicy. He knows those theodicies. He wants to argue, to some degree along with Dante, don't ask, why did this happen to me? When rebuffs, as he will use the term, happens, but rather learn to ask, why did this happen for me? We will get to it in a moment. Finally, uh, we're looking at Whitman from five perspectives. Whitman is person. We're going to hear quite a bit of that in this poem because Whitman himself was not... Uh, supported throughout most of his professional writing life. People were made deeply uncomfortable by Leaves of Grass. I mean, we, we will hit passages in Leaves of Grass that will make many readers even today uncomfortable before its time, no question. How did he respond to that? Whitman as person, obviously Whitman as poet is significant as well as pedagogue, that is to say instructor, teacher, and finally Whitman as politician, his celebration especially of the democratic ideals, and then Whitman as Philosopher. Now, of course, when we think about philosophers, we think about someone like Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus, the great introducers of what we call Stoicism. And as we pick up this poem, Me in Paterbe, we'll see a certain kind of Stoicism is at, at play, no question. Now, as we always do, we'll mess around a little bit with some background information here just to start with. Um, first of all, this was number 18, this poem, of the Chance Democratic of Leaves of Grass from 1860. It was transferred to inscriptions in 1881. It is in many ways, Norton will suggest, remindful of the counsels to himself, which Walt Whitman often entered in his own notebooks. It is little changed from the original manuscript. Uh, Whitman, as we often suggest that you would do in 303, Whitman was a great lover of journaling, of notes and note-taking and the like, writing notes to himself, and as Hugh Prather will call it, notes to myself. And this idea that we've learned from our study of Natalie Goldberg, this idea of writing down the bones and wild mind, that sometimes what we say to ourselves is so powerful, so important, will aid us in profound ways. Now, let's turn to the poem itself. It's one of the more uh, um, fun, fun to read poems as well. 
Notice the repetition of the word me three times in this poem. Me and perturbe. Me and perturbe, standing at ease in nature, master of all or mistress of all, a plum in the midst of irrational things, imbued as they, passive, receptive, silent as they, finding my occupation, poverty, notoriety, foibles, crimes, less important than I thought, me toward the Mexican Sea, or in the Manhattan, or the Tennessee, or far north, or inland, a river man, or a man of the woods, or of any farm life of these states, or of the coast, or the lakes, or Canada. Me, wherever my life is lived, oh, to be self-balanced for contingencies, to confront night, storms, hunger, ridicule, accidents, rebuffs, as the trees and animals do. Now, we're going to finish with trees and animals. We're going to begin, of course, with the poet speaker here, me. Now, let's just put it in our notes right away, because we haven't said a lot about this yet. There are multiple Whitmans when one picks up leaves of grass. Okay, We're going to meet this over and over again in our study of Song of Myself. So let's get ready for it now. Who is the Walt Whitman that writes all these poems? That is a difficult question to answer. Here, it is the me who longs to have an answer to the theodicy question. Why is it that bad things have to happen? As Milton will call it in our lectures on Paradise Lost, to justify the ways of God to men. Why is it bad things have to happen? Why must I be challenged? Me, imperturbe, notice right away this imperturbe word will be defined as standing at ease in nature. By the way, note that nature is capitalized, and immediately we think about Emerson, we think about Thoreau, as we're talking about nature, capital N, that it's master of all, or mistress of all, notice the repetition of the word all, notice the inclusivity in the language of both ma male and um, masculine and feminine, right? Aplomb is, as well, a key word. Self-confidence, assurance, in the midst of irrational things. We immediately think of our Emily Dickinson, much madness is divine as sense of the discerning eye. Notice that irrational things here will mean at the end for him trees and animals, but it can also just mean the craziness of this world. In other words, he says, here's what I would like to be. I'd like to be a person who can stand in the middle of insanity and somehow survive, somehow be able to have a level of confidence and assurance. The word imbued is a powerful, again, word. He loves these words that will elicit notions of um, blessings, of, of gifts that are given by nature, something that is urge or procreant, imbued as they, that is to say, we'll say these irrational things. For example, we immediately start to think about Thoreau and his celebration of trees in, in, in Walden. Uh, go back and take a look at our, uh, at our lectures there when we talked about how much Thoreau respects trees for very similar reasons for Whitman here. In Butte is they. Well, what are they? Notice you have your trinities. Back to our Augustine again. Our trinities are threes. Passive, receptive, silent is they. Now this word silent is going to be for us significant because we're going to look at another poem later, I Sit and Look Out, where Whitman will talk in his theodicy about all the terrible things he sees and then the last word of that poem is in fact the word silent. Now we're not going to say that this is uncaring silence, because we know Whitman was anything but uncaring, but it is, notice, a trinity that's quite fascinating. Passive, receptive, silent. In other words, the ability to kind of take in everything, to pay attention. We might say it that way for our notes. Whitman is a great listener, a great watcher, and he challenges us to be a great listener or a great watcher, and obviously we would say as well a great reader, right? Notice, finding, it's, it's a quest, right? The word finding suggests this, finding my occupation. What am I supposed to do with my life? How will I fill my days? My poverty. It's important to point out that Whitman was never a wealthy man, and even when he had some means, it was nothing in comparison to probably what he could have had if he could have been recognized 
as the great artist poet ultimately that he became. Notoriety, well, he, he was notorious sometimes, right? That is to say, it wasn't always positive, that the, 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 his fame. The foibles, he's going to play this one out all the way through Leaves of Grass. There's things I've done I'm not happy with. Like what? Oh, I'll get to it later. And he never actually comes out so often. Notice the next word is crimes, which is a significant word. What crimes did Whitman, the me of this poem, Commit. Well, it's interesting because, again, he's enigmatic as Whitman is person. We're not sure. Less important than I thought. Well, now, here it is. This is the humility, and I think this is why I can argue so easily how influenced T.S. Eliot was by Whitman, right? The only wisdom we can hope to acquire is the wisdom of humility. Humility is endless, he says in East Coker. And notice, when one comes to this kind of recognition of the irrational things, one is have to have, one has to butt up against the sense of humility. Go for walks in the woods, go for time in the badlands, go spend time on the hill, and you will feel small next to Cloud Peak, that large, majestic mountain that we live uh, next to, right? The second me, then, will take him as traveler, as Odyssean traveler, as journeyer toward different parts of America. Whitman was acutely aware that he would use language like this at the time he was using it to discuss all of the different parts of America. If there are multiple Whitmans, there are multiple Americas. And notice here, he'll play the game of the Mexican Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, or in the Manhattan. Now, we want to pay attention to this Manhattan, and I'll turn now back to our Nortons for a moment. This Indian name for his city so pleased Whitman that he used it many times in his poetry. So pay attention to the use of this word. Obviously, we know Manhattan itself, right, in, in New York City. Irving had also popularized it in his Knickerbocker's History of New York from 1809, Book 3, Chapter 1, The Lovely Island, quote, The Lovely Island of Manhattan. The name is an Algonquin word, uh, meaning large island. Okay, and, uh, and to that degree, Whitman loves these special kind of words. Pamanok will be another one later on that we'll play around with. Notice it's or in the Manhattan or the Tennessee. I mean, before Whitman, nobody put together these two kinds of terms. Manhattan, Tennessee, those are two geographically quite different places. And yet, by 1881, when he's publishing this poem, People knew a lot about Tennessee because of the war, obviously, and, and, and the terrible things that would, the battles that would be fought down there, right? Or, he says, far north, or inland, uh, all, over, all over America. And then, different types of occupations. This will take us to I Hear America Singing, a poem that we'll see here in a few minutes. Um, a river man, a man of the woods or of any farm life of these states, notice we're back to these states, states capitalized, or of the coast, or the lakes, or notice his spelling of Canada with the K, to go back, go back to our comments on through the states there, that uh, kind of um, idiomatic way that he decides to spell Canada all the way through uh, leaves of grass. And then finally the third me, me. Wherever my life is lived, and all of a sudden notice because of the previous two me's, we are beginning to recognize that this speaker, Whitman's speaker, is identifying with multiple kinds of people, multiple Americans, me, wherever my life has lived. And then this word, oh. He loves this word. It will be one of those kind of euphemistic uses in Leaves of Grass that is at the same time respectful, it is laudatory, it is celebrated, and of course it will remind us of singing and chanting. Oh, to be self-balanced, and this will be his definition of imperturbe, right? Self-balanced for contingencies. Balanced. Harmonious. And then finally, notice the use of to twice here, T-O, to be self-balanced for contingencies, to confront, back to more interesting uh, war, war, war language confrontation, to confront Night. Now here's an interesting list, and this will remind us of the list that we see that Wordsworth will play with his, uh, with his sister Dorothy at the conclusion of Ten Turn Abbey. Go back and take a look at that one. All of the different kinds of challenges that are coming for all of us. Night, storms, hunger. Whitman knew a thing or two about this one. 
Ridicule certainly knew a thing or two about that one because people were often making fun of him. Accidents, rebuffs, that pushing away. I mean, it's true that some of the greatest writers and artists of Whitman's day had to say, uh, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know if I can go there with him in Leaves of Grass. Rebuffs. And then he says, I wish I could handle all of those. Nights, storms, hunger, ridicule, accidents, rebuffs. As the irrational things from above. Trees and animals do. And immediately here we think about passage 32 of Song of Myself. I think I could turn and live with the animals. To finish now at 2A. Well, this is his theodicy. And, and he's introducing it. We're going to hear a whole bunch about it. Trust me. That is to say, when bad things happen... When rebuffs happen, when accidents happen, we have to learn to ask not, why did this happen to me? But rather, why did this happen for me? That is to say, not that we want pain or suffering in our lives, but when it comes, as it certainly will, can we use it as a propedeutic, instructional, didactic? Can we learn something about ourselves and the world we live in? He says, that's what I learned from trees. That's what I learned from the animals. Of course, here we're talking about the need for self-reliance. At 2B, the symbolism of the tree and the animals obviously is powerful. At 3A, well, we think of so many Whitman poems. I sit and look out, I've already mentioned, as well as passage 32 from Song of Myself, Emerson's Self-Reliance. I would also here um, challenge you to go back and look at my lecture and comments at learnstrunk.net on Emerson's essay, Nature. And the idea that the, the, the idea of being able to see through nature and that all-seeing eyeball and all of that is important, as well as I, I've mentioned it already, my comments from Thoreau's Walden, the way that he recognizes the power of trees as instructional. Finally, in 3B, how can we own a poem like this? Well, it's somewhat self-evident when you read a poem like this because of those three me's to ask about ourselves. How, how do you confront things like ridicule and rebuffs? That is to say, how do you practice your own theodicy? Do you envy, as Whitman seems to, the trees and the animals? Do you wish to be more like them or less like them? That is to say, are you imperturbe? And to what degree do you need to grow in your capacity of self-reliance? Uh, if Whitman does anything, he challenges us to stand up, take responsibility, and be a better me, right? Thank you.